Greetings. My name is C.J. Levick, and I am the author and founder of Rock Island Books. I trust you will be blessed as you view this video, and I would like to invite you to assist Rock Island Books in our urgent desire to proclaim the very soon coming of our Lord and the very soon coming of the 70th week of Daniel. The world is about to change in ways we can hardly imagine, and when it does... I am convinced that almost all Christian YouTube videos and Christian media will be censored or removed from the Internet. When we are gone, what will the world think? Will they believe the lies that will be told about our disappearance? Please consider assisting us in getting this message into the places that cannot be canceled by going to Rock Island Books and purchasing one of our 2024 Prophetic Prophecy series, presented on DVDs that cannot be canceled in order that those that remain will have a testimony that might just be the very thing that leads them to the Lord, who is now and always the only hope for lost and dying people and the lost and dying world that is literally passing away. Welcome to the Mystery of the Rapture. Mentioning the word rapture today is like waving a red flag in front of an angry bull. The rapture has become one of the most controversial, hot-button issues among Christians today. So let's begin our investigation into this hot topic with the simple question. Hopefully, the answer will realign this doctrine with its original intent, and that is to bring comfort and hope to Christians, many of whom have forgotten that they are pilgrims in this world and it is not our home. Where did the doctrine of the rapture of the church come from, and who started it? It was the night before the dead, beaten, mangled, and bloody body of Jesus was lovingly taken off the rude wooden cross by two of his secret disciples, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus. What most Christians do not know is that before he died, the king of the Jews, Jesus, issued a final end times prophetic announcement of a future event. The prophet Isaiah, looking ahead over 500 years into the future, has given us a prophetic glimpse of what Jesus the Christ accomplished when he died on the cross of Calvary. Let me read just a few excerpts from the prophecy from Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of the dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs, and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities, and the chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. What I have just read is a small prophetic slice of the voluminous prophetic scriptures that predicted the epic event that is literally the crux or crossroads of all history. Jesus knew Isaiah's prophecy. He knew what it was about, and he knew it was about to be fulfilled. And so with that foreknowledge in mind, wouldn't you like to know what Jesus privately said to his believing disciples just hours before he was arrested and crucified? Something so amazing that could not have been possible at the time Jesus announced it and was only put on the prophetic calendar from our point of view on the same day that Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary. So now let's go back in time from the moment Jesus was nailed to the cross at 9 o'clock in the morning to the night where we find Jesus and 12 of his disciples in the upper room where they would celebrate the Passover meal that had been prepared just for this important occasion. 
Let's see if we can discover, in the hours that Jesus and his disciple were in the upper room, the genesis of the doctrine that teaches what is commonly known as the rapture or the departure of the church. So let's begin our investigation of the genesis of the teaching of the departure of the church as we walk step by step through the 13th and 14th chapters of the Gospel of John. In John 13, 1, we read, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. This would be a Passover celebration like no other, an event filled with new revelation, revelation that was lovingly taught to the dull disciples of Jesus who would barely understand what Jesus was talking about, eleven disciples that would soon be witnesses to the most amazing event to ever transpire on the earth, and then, to their utter amazement, be filled with the Holy Spirit of God in order that they might bring to remembrance all that took place including the night before Jesus was crucified, in order that they might be guided by truth and filled with power from on high, power that came with both insight, revelation, and a courage that can only be described as supernatural. This was all revealed just before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, and he should depart out of the world and return to his Father in heaven. So we ask, where was the doctrine of the departure of the church first revealed? The answer, in the upper room where Jesus and his disciples celebrated the Passover, on the same day Jesus was crucified. Who was this doctrine of the departure of the church revealed to? The answer, to his own, the ones he would love unto the end. Who was the revelation not revealed to? The answer, Judas Iscariot the one disciple who would betray Jesus that very night. Note that nothing is revealed to the true disciples of Jesus until the one false disciple of Jesus has left to both figuratively and literally depart into the night. This part of the story is carefully declared in John 13:21. Listen. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And then finally we read in John 13:30, He, Judas Iscariot, then having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Listen carefully to the words of Jesus after Judas was no longer in the upper room. In John 13:33, we read, Little children, yet a little while, and I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come. Now in verse 36, we discover the disciples' response to the news that Jesus is going somewhere, that they cannot go. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, Whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. This is the first hint of the revelation of the rapture, according to Jesus. I invite you to notice two things. First, Peter and the rest of the disciples cannot go where Jesus is going. But unlike the unbelieving Jews that can never follow Jesus to where he is going, the disciples of Jesus are given the first glimmer of hope. Jesus tells them that while they cannot follow him now, they will follow him afterwards. At this point, we need to pause in order to go back in time another couple days when the disciples of Jesus had all collectively experienced a what-are-you-kidding-me moment. It happened while they were all just leaving the temple where Jesus had been teaching and while they were on their way to the Mount of Olives. You can read about this in Matthew chapter 24. Of course, no drama can really get going without a Jewish mother, and our drama begins a little earlier with another mother, the mother of James and John, who along with all the rest of the disciples were so certain that Jesus was the Messiah on a mission to deliver Israel from the clutches of Roman rule and make Israel the head of all the nations as prophesied in the scriptures. Here we read in Matthew 20:20, 20, 20, Then came to him the mother of Zebedee's children with her sons, 
worshiping him and desiring a certain thing of him. And he, Jesus, said unto her, What wilt thou? She saith unto him, Grant that these my two sons may sit, the one on thy right hand, and the other on thy left, in thy kingdom. This, of course, created a what, are you kidding me moment with the other ten disciples, who were obviously unhappy with James and John, and probably a little upset with themselves for not thinking of it first. But the ultimate, what are you kidding me moment came when Jesus went from the perspective, king of Israel in waiting, to a prophet of doom and gloom, who, to the surprise of the disciples, began talking about the destruction of the temple? The very place the disciples thought they would soon be setting up their headquarters as vice regents in the kingdom of Jesus, the Messiah. Judas, who was probably the shrewdest of the bunch, had already concluded that Jesus was not headed in the direction he had imagined, and with that knowledge, purposed in his heart to cut his losses, and as he schemed, to deliver Jesus into the hands of his enemies for the price of thirty pieces of silver. Things were not going as planned for the disciples. That was becoming clear, and yet the eleven would not betray their Lord. But make no mistake, they were having a serious, what are you kidding me moment. The scriptures inform us that Jesus knew what was in the minds of men. Clearly, the disciples of Jesus were experiencing information overload. Overload that was producing a tumult in their hearts, and Jesus knew it. The disciples of Jesus had a lot of information to process, and by all accounts, they were not doing a very good job of dealing with it. By simply reading the account recorded for us in Matthew 24, you get the glimpse of the grim images that were filling their minds and hearts that only a few days earlier were full of the optimistic expectations that Jesus the Messiah was about to set up his kingdom in Jerusalem where they would be ruling and reigning the entire world and reigning triumphantly by his side. Mix the evaporation of that expectation with the sorrowful news that Jesus was going to leave them to go someplace they could not follow, and you have a recipe for mental confusion. It is into this tempest and fever of mind that Jesus introduces a new doctrine, a fresh promise, a blessed hope that is meant to steady their course, give them courage, and fill them with confidence. And that is exactly what it accomplished, eventually. I say eventually because the events that followed and what we learn about the disciples immediately after the death of Jesus proves that the eleven disciples of Jesus were having a really tough time making sense of all this. So let's begin by examining the remedy for this as we listen to the words of Jesus word by word as recorded in John chapter 14. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now after listening to all the prophecy about his upcoming death, all the signs of the end of the age, and his second coming to be preceded by the most terrible time of tribulation ever that would include the generation that perished in the flood and the generation that perished in the white-hot sulfur torrent that evaporated Sodom and Gomorrah, after all this, and in all the growing darkness that betrayed men's hatred for their Creator, a darkness that spawned the exceeding wickedness of man as it brought the wages of their iniquity within the prophetic view of Jesus, who had clearly described the coming wrath it would incur. In light of all this, Jesus tells his disciples to calm their hearts. As there is one more revelation he wanted them to grab onto. One more disclosure that would be the wellspring of hope and comfort. Jesus begins with those amazing words that have the authority of all heaven to back them up. Let not your hearts be troubled. But why should they not have troubled hearts, you might ask? The answer is simple. God has a plan for them that is better than anything they can imagine, and certainly better than anything they expect, as their own reason and perspective tells them that this is the perfect time to be troubled, as they see the future 
the one they had imagined, slip away before their very eyes. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus speaks these words into a storm, every bit as dangerous as the storm that suddenly arose in the Sea of Galilee and threatened the lives of all the disciples as Jesus slept in the fishing boat that all the disciples were certain was about to sink with them in it. Jesus spoke the words, Peace be still, and the storm immediately ceased. But these words of Jesus, Let not your heart be troubled, did not immediately have the same effect as it seems little comfort was received that night in the upper room. And Jesus knew that. He also knew that this was the time to make the declaration as it would soon become clear. These words of comfort are also obviously meant for all the disciples of Jesus down through the ages that include all those who have put their confidence and trust in Jesus the Savior. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, says Jesus, and then adds, Believe also in me. Now here we have a preamble that screams something that almost everybody misses. Do you know what it is? To find the answer, let's look at how Jesus handled revelation regarding himself. The life and ministry of Jesus was guided by and fulfilled a divine template that had been previously revealed in the scriptures. So listen to these few proof texts and see if you can grasp the overarching theme. In Matthew 26, 56, we read, But all this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. In Luke 4, 21, Jesus says to them, And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Luke 24, 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. In Luke twenty four forty five, then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And finally, John five thirty nine, Jesus says, Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Do you see the pattern? It's always the same, well, almost always. In John 2.22, we read this, When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. They believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now let's listen once more to what Jesus is revealing to his disciples and see if you notice what is missing. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Did you catch it? There is no mention of previous scripture being fulfilled. Jesus does not rebuke his disciples in order to remind them of the scriptures that prove his words. Why not? The answer is simple. Jesus is revealing something brand new. In fact, Jesus has spent most of the time in the hours they spent together in the upper room declaring to the eleven disciples things that were not in the Old Testament, things that would soon be in the New Testament scriptures. Read through chapters 13 and 14 of John and then ask yourself the following question. On whose authority does Jesus create a new commandment that his disciples were to love one another? What was wrong with the old commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. The answer is very instructive when you think about it. Jesus introduces a brand new commandment that was meant to be the identifying mark of all those that are his disciples in the future. They would love one another. Something to keep in mind as we discuss the rapture. On whose authority did Jesus create a new ordinance that we observe to this day called the Lord's Supper? And on whose authority did Jesus introduce a new eschatology that was unknown to his disciples? Jesus introduces a new vision of the end times that replaced nothing, but added something that was unknown to the disciples of Jesus and was not disclosed in the Old Testament scripture. On whose authority is the new commandment decreed, a new ordinance inaugurated, and a brand new prophetic end times prophecy declared? The answer is by the authority of his heavenly Father.
Notice it was not the authority of previously published scripture that Jesus would have expected any first century Jew or any of his disciples to know about. Now I want to be careful, and you will notice I am not saying that this mystery was not hidden in shadows and types in the Old Testament scripture, but only that it was secreted away in scripture in order that it might be discovered after the fact and in support of what clearly is meant to be viewed as newly revealed truth. So when you hear Jesus saying, you believe in God, believe also in me, you are to understand two things clearly. One is that Jesus claimed that the Father indwelt him, and he and the Father were one, making himself equal with God, and also that he did nothing, including revealing new information, unless it was in obedience to the Father. So Jesus claims divine authority, and just to make sure his disciples get it, he added the following tagline, If it were not so, I would have told you. In other words, Jesus is telling them that this is not happy talk to ward off the depression and sorrow of the disciples. This was truth to be appropriated as gospel. And while it was not immediately transformative, it became that, and much more, once the disciples were filled with the Holy Spirit of truth and all the implications of this glorious truth came back into their remembrance. So now, let's look one more time at the familiar words of Jesus through the lens of this new prophetic revelation presented on the day Jesus died. Revelation for what was coming and what was that? The mystery of the church. This was new information a new revelation for a new assembly of believers that would be raised up from among both Jews and Gentiles to form a new body, a new group that would eventually be called Christians, the body of Christ, and the bride. But let's read it one more time with ears tuned to the prophetic significance and distinctiveness of what Jesus is clearly teaching. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled, ye believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. This new revelation is progressive, and it will be filled in with lots of important details as Jesus reveals more and more about this to his disciples, including the Apostle Paul, whose testimony of these additional revelations received by him from the risen Lord Jesus was recorded for us in the New Testament Scriptures. So while additional details will be added, make no mistake, the original disclosure of the blessed hope and what we know as the rapture is revealed in a nutshell by Jesus. Now listen carefully to the doctrine of the departure of the church in a nutshell. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. No one can mistake the clear message Jesus himself declares to the eleven disciples. Jesus is going back to heaven. And he wants his disciples to know that in heaven, his father has a house with many rooms in it. And Jesus additionally wants his disciples to know that he is going to his father's house in order to prepare a place for each one of us. And then Jesus clearly tells us, that just as certainly as he's going to prepare a special place for us, he is also going to return to fetch us in order that we might dwell in the heavenly home that he has prepared for us so that where he is, we might be also. Now this is all we would need to know, but God graciously gives us much more information about the rapture event as he reveals added details to the Apostle Paul in order that he might pass it on to the church So if you think the rapture was an idea invented by Tim, left behind LaHaye, or Hal, the late great planet Earth Lindsay, or the Schofield Study Bible, or John Nelson Dispensational Darby, you're wrong. These are wonderful men, but they were just repeating what Jesus said. The rapture of the church is a doctrine introduced by Jesus Christ, and if you have a problem with it, as many seem to for reasons I can't understand. Well, may I say, as kindly as I can, you need to take the matter up with Jesus, who clearly taught it, in order that we might clearly believe it. 
We begin with eight of the most promising words in the New Testament. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. There is nothing about this simple statement recorded in John 14 that's difficult to understand. While it's absolutely apparent that Jesus is revealing something new, it's also something that is uncomplicated and clear. Jesus said, I am going. I am going in order to prepare something. Something not previously revealed. I'm going to prepare a place. For who? For his disciples. Are you one of his disciples? If the answer is yes, then Jesus is going to prepare a place for you. And notice that Jesus leaves us a no doubt about when he is going to heaven to prepare a place for you. Do you remember what he told his disciples as recorded in John 13, 33, where we read, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Consider what an interesting revelation this is in light of what is going to happen in the ninth hour after he spoke those very words. The ninth hour is three o'clock in the afternoon of that very day based on Jewish reckoning. So the very day he spoke these words to his disciples, he would be pronounced dead by a battle-hardened centurion soldier, taken down from the cross by two of his secret disciples, and just moments before sunset placed in a rich man's tomb, just as was prophesied in Isaiah 53, 9. Now, if that were the end of the story, all his disciples, no matter how the life of Jesus had impacted them for good, would be in a place so bad it's described as most miserable, pitiable, and hopeless. Have you ever sat at the bedside of a loved one that is at death's door? Have you ever said your goodbyes to a friend or relative who you knew was not going to live out the day or the week? What do you say to someone who is just about to draw their last breath and leave this world? Well, if you're a Christian and your dying friend is a Christian, you tell them that you're going to miss them for a little while. But we'll soon be joining them. You remind them and yourself that the goodbye is temporary and the reunion is forever. You comfort them with the assurance that you will be seeing them soon. In a little while, the tears of the goodbye will be replaced by the joy of one day greeting them again in heaven where there is no more death or sorrow and no more parting. Is this what Jesus was telling his disciples, knowing he would die by the end of that very day? Remember that the Jewish day begins with sunset and ends at sunset, and so Jesus is literally revealing this to them less than 15 to 16 hours from the cross event that will result in his death just a few hours before sunset. Is this what Jesus was saying? Were the words spoken that day, including the final seven words spoken from the cross, the final words of the living Jesus on the earth? It is finished. The debt is paid. I will see you later. Don't be sad. I will come back some day. Well, that would have been enough. But God, who is rich in mercy, had something else in mind for the ones who loved and trusted the crucified and risen Jesus. One last miracle that began with his resurrection and ended with his departure from the ones who would be the ones who would inaugurate the mystery of the church. And so the answer is absolutely not. Jesus knew he would see his disciples again after his death and before he went to prepare a place for them in his father's house. And so Jesus said in John 13, 33, Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Jesus would, after his bodily resurrection, literally pass in and out of their lives for a period of 40 days, admonishing them for their unbelief encouraging them to search the scriptures in order to find him, preparing them for their new ministry, challenging them, commissioning them to preach the gospel of his death, burial, and resurrection to all the world, and finally blessing them as he bodily arose from the Mount of Olives and disappeared into the clouds where he was seen no more, leaving them with one final instruction recorded for us in Luke twenty four forty nine. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. Immediately after these final instructions, Jesus led his disciples to the place where he would fulfill his promise to be with them just a little while longer, before he left, in order to prepare a place for them in heaven, where they would dwell in his presence forever. We know he is coming back in a day and in an hour that no man knows. But did you know that he left on a day, and at an hour they did not expect, and yet it was not unexpected? 
This is a dot that needs to be connected, and happily, a search of the scriptures connects it for us. From this point on, I want you to begin looking for clues that have been purposely placed in front of you, like breadcrumbs that are meant to lead you to an amazing truth. The disciples did not know the day or the hour Jesus would leave to go to his Father. They only knew he would be with them a little while longer. Certainly they knew he was going, but they did not know when. We do not know what the last words of Jesus were before he left this world to go to his Father to prepare a place for his disciples and us. But we do know what kind of words they were. Listen to Luke 24:50 through 52 And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. Notice that the last words of Jesus can be summarized as a shower of blessing. Jesus literally rained on his disciples. As Jesus rose, he showered them with blessings. The eleven disciples had been invited to the most amazing mountaintop experience to ever transpire on the earth. This is where Jesus finally demonstrated the force and power of his words with a deed that only God could accomplish, and for reasons that were meant to not only astonish them, but to also ignite their faith and create an expectation that they were commissioned to pass along to everyone they shared the good news with. Notice that the hearts of the disciples, who just 40 days earlier were in sorrow and confusion, hearts that were broken and despondent when the Lord told them he was going someplace they could not follow, are now being refreshed with words that filled them with hope as they experienced the first glorious rays of the blessed hope. The ascension of Jesus was a rehearsal for a new promise that they first heard with their physical ears a hearing that resulted in sorrow and confusion in the upper room. Now they are hearing those words, I go to prepare a place for you, with their hearts. The truth always ultimately fills those who love the Lord with hope. The promise and pattern of his return was meant to fill them and us with an unfailing and unfading hope, the blessed hope. His appearance for a period of 40 days not only convinced his 11 disciples, but also over 500 who had loved Jesus while he was alive and would give testimony to his literal and bodily resurrection from the grave. How amazing is that? Who has ever heard of anything like that? But notice that the same Jesus that said, I go to prepare a place for you, matched his words with a miraculous deed. Notice that only his disciples were invited to witness this exclusive engagement that was meant to transform their lives and testimonies as it filled them with joy and expectancy. The disciples of Jesus had witnessed some pretty amazing things. They witnessed Jesus walking on water, raising the dead, turning water to wine, healing the lame, the blind, the afflicted, casting out demons, and much, much, much more. But notice that what they were about to witness was unlike anything they'd ever seen before. The 40 post-resurrection days of Jesus was witnessed as a proof that the words of Jesus were to be taken literally as the enlarged group of those that loved Jesus numbered around 500. This larger group of those that loved Jesus were given the privilege of literally interacting with the living Jesus after he rose from the dead, but apparently none of them witnessed the event that was reserved for the disciples of Jesus. Why do you suppose that was? Why would no one except the disciples see Jesus ascend up to the clouds where he disappeared, having gone to prepare a place for us? The answer to this question is the foundational clue and truth of the rapture of the church. Let's put the entire scene in context in order to begin to grapple with the amazing truth that are plainly meant to inform us of something new, something coming in the future, something that is connected with the gospel that is never meant to be decoupled from the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and is distinctive from the second coming of Jesus. The one thing that cannot go missing without leaving us in doubt and despair is the fact that the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus is the cornerstone in the blessed hope that cannot be separated from the gospel. You simply cannot understand the gospel delivered to the apostles in order to evangelize the world with the proclamation of the grace of God based on the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus without the blessed hope. To preach the gospel without preaching the blessed hope is a foreign concept to the apostles and was central in the teaching 
of the one apostle, the Apostle Paul, who was commissioned by Jesus himself to be the messenger to the Gentiles who would become the called out assembly of believers we call the church. So let's take another look at this through the eyes of a supernatural expectant hope in order to see how the ascension of Christ is a harbinger of the departure of the mystery church known by all today as the rapture of those in Christ. In Acts 1, we read, starting with verse 1, The former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Until the day in which he was taken up, after that he, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own hands, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And in Luke 24, 49 through 52, we read, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem, until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass, while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven, and they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And finally, in Acts 1.10, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken from you into heaven, shall soon come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now pattern is prophecy. So see if you can see the outline of the pattern that proclaims to this day the one prophecy that is so prominent, so glorious, that without it we are left without hope in this world, with no hope for the future, and expecting only the wrath of God. But a question still lingers in the minds of some Christians. Is the ascension of Christ from the Mount of Olives a picture of the second coming or the rapture of the church? I would like to share with you why the ascension of Jesus into the clouds that escorts him to heaven is a picture of the rapture of the church. I have already asked the question regarding who it was that witnessed the ascension of Jesus, so in order that this important clue not be lost, let me ask again the following questions. Were any of the religious class, any of the unbelieving Sadducees and Pharisees invited to witness Christ's ascension? The answer is no. What about the representatives of Rome? Were they invited to witness this event? The answer again, no. What about the skeptics and fence-sitters, those looking for just one more sign that Jesus was the Messiah? Were they invited in order to get them on board with the program that was about to unfold? The answer is that they were nowhere in sight. Now notice that two angels, who appeared as young men, dressed in white, suddenly appeared in order to ask the disciples why they are still looking up into the heavens where the Lord has vanished from their sight, veiled by a cloud. They ask, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? And if that was all they said, then we would not have been invited to search this out for its prophetic significance. The two angelic messengers could have dazzled the disciples with their angelic glory, enough to send any man to the ground face down, but they did not. The Lord would allow nothing to overshadow what they had just witnessed, his ascension. The two angels were there as messengers of the blessed hope, announced by Jesus in the upper room, demonstrated on the Mount of Olives, and confirmed by the mouths of two angelic messengers. And so without apology or fear of chasing shadows or making a mountain out of a molehill, we are left with a small mystery to solve. 
a mystery that is revealed by the Son of God, demonstrated by the Son of God, and confirmed by two of God's messengers, angels, who report to the men of Galilee, the eleven disciples of Jesus. Listen to what they said one more time. The same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. So what is the first hallmark of the ascension of Jesus to heaven? The answer is simple and very instructive. He was only seen by his disciples. It was a private, invitation-only event that was reserved for the eleven disciples who had been chosen by Jesus to launch a new work that was based on a new assembly of believers that would be distinctive from all the rest of mankind by one simple glorious fact. They had confessed Jesus as Lord, they had trusted in the finished work of Christ, and one more thing, something amazing and miraculous, they were born again and inhabited by the Holy Spirit of God. What makes a Christian? The answer is simple. A Christian is someone who is in Christ, inhabited supernaturally by the Spirit of God. So what is distinctive about the ascension that cannot be said of the second coming? It was only witnessed by the apostles who would proclaim the gospel that would result in faith in Christ and a new birth from on high. Remember that the ascension is tied to the promise made in the upper room, the promise made right after Jesus told his disciples he would only be with them for a little while longer. The promise made to only those who would inhabit heaven. An exclusive promise made to a select group of men who would witness his departure in order that they might understand the miracle of the rapture of the church when Christ comes exclusively to fulfill a solemn promise he made to his disciples, those that follow and trust him, and have been supernaturally filled with the Spirit of God, a promise made to all those that put their faith and trust in Christ alone. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Exploring the Lord's 7,000-year sabbatical calendar Connecting the prophecy dots in the Bible is like opening a thousand-piece puzzle box, dumping all the pieces on the table, and working tirelessly to assemble them. Well, actually, prophetic puzzles can be much more difficult, in fact, impossible without the guidance of the Holy Spirit, and a bold faith that believes God and understands that God is never wrong and that His Word is 100% trustworthy. We all struggle with our own spiritual blindness. God has no such problem, and He is kind and gracious to those who are seeking Him with all their hearts in order to know Him better in order to understand him more fully. And the only way that happens is with his help. So I pray for his help as I do my best to share with you where we are on God's prophetic calendar. There are literally hundreds of prophetic puzzle pieces in the Bible, but just like the box that contains all the puzzle pieces, the frame around the puzzle needs to be connected before the puzzle picture can come into focus. The short prophetic puzzle pieces in this nutshell epilogue will be put at the end of all my future videos in order to reveal the 10 biblical proofs that I am depending upon as the foundation for teaching what the scripture reveals about the Lord's prophetic sabbatical 7,000 year calendar, the oldest biblical prophecy perspective in the entire world. To accomplish this in 15 minutes means I am only presenting a very brief and abbreviated summary of a corpus of my own published and unpublished videos and articles produced in the past 10 years that are hundreds of hours long, distilled and condensed to a brief overview in the hope that this will give you the confidence to explore in much greater depth the prophetic vistas published in this and upcoming videos. So this will not answer all your questions, but it will answer the question, How do I know the dates I'm disclosing are correct? After all, a 7,000-year prophetic calendar with an incorrect and unreliable start date, well, it may get close to the mark, and 100 years ago would have been interesting, a novelty. 50 years ago, it would have been very interesting, and 10 years ago, it would have been exciting. But producing such a calendar months before it is announcing the departure of the church? Well, you better know what you're talking about, and your sources better be impeccable. So yes, I am not unaware of the risks of producing something that ends up being wrong. I'm more aware 
of the risk of sitting on my hands when there is urgent need for saints and sinners to know where we are on God's prophetic time clock. I am confident that what I am sharing is correct. The question remains, who am I listening to? What are my sources? How in the world can I know that the dates I am depending upon to come to my conclusions are correct? Let's begin with a question I get most often that is also the key date that unlocks most of the other prophetic dates on God's 7,000-year calendar. So question one, how do I know that Yeshua died on the cross on Nisan 14, April 5th in 30 AD on the Roman calendar? Obviously, there are many proofs of this historically recognized date. But how do I know that 30 AD is the crucifixion date of Yeshua? Now, at this point, I could spend an hour explaining all this and hardly scratch the surface. And it would be worth watching. But please remember, this is a Bible prophecy summary in a very small nutshell. So let's begin. The answer is found in Ezekiel 4, verses 6 and 7. You might want to go and read the entire chapter. Listen to what the Lord told Ezekiel. And when thou hast accomplished them, lie again on thy right side, and thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah forty days. I have appointed thee each day for a year. Therefore thou shalt set thy face toward the siege of Jerusalem, and thine arm shall be uncovered, and thou shalt prophesy against it. The time of iniquity prophesied by Ezekiel was 40 years to be followed by a siege of Jerusalem. The siege of Jerusalem, prophetically in view, happened exactly 40 years after the crucifixion of Yeshua that took place in 30 AD. In other words, the 70 AD siege of Jerusalem minus 40 years lands you or takes you back to the year 30 AD just as God said it would through his prophet Ezekiel. The iniquity of Judah was the worst crime ever committed on earth as it was the crucifixion of the Son of God. So the answer to the question, how do I know Jesus was crucified on Nisan 14, April 5th, 30 A.D.? Well, the Bible tells me so. Question two, how do I know Adam sinned in the year 3971? In Genesis 1.1, this question is answered in the first Hebrew word in the Bible. I call this the Bereshit Passover prophecy that reveals the first evangelium, the gospel story and pictures, and then based on the Hebrew script that is also Numbers, reveals the time duration in Numbers in the first word in the Bible, just like Isaiah prophesied in chapter 46, 9 and 10. Listen to what the prophet says. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. A word directly from God, spoken through the prophet Isaiah. The numeric time duration revelation is discovered in the word beginning, that is the last five letters in the six-letter word Bereshit, and it fulfills this prophecy. Ta 400 times Yod 10, God's multiplier, 10 being ordinal perfection, equals 4,000. 4,000 years takes us to the cross event. The cross event happened in 30 AD, so we go back in time, 4,000 years, and it reveals the year that the first Adam sinned in 3971. So, answer number two, how do I know Adam sinned on Elul 29 in 3971 BC? The Bible tells me so. Question three, how do I know that Yeshua was born in 5 BC? Well, this mystery is solved when you understand that the last Adam was patterning his life, death, and resurrection, that's Yeshua HaMashiach, in order to undo or reverse the curse of the first Adam that sinned. Since Adam was created on the sixth day of creation, on Tishri 6, and we know he sinned in the year 3971 BC, let's do the math. The life of Yeshua was about 30 years old when he began his three-and-a-half-year ministry that began in the fall and ended with his resurrection on Nisan 17, three days after his Wednesday crucifixion on Nisan 14. April 5th, 30 A.D. is when Jesus died on the cross. Thirty-three-and-a-half years times 365.25 equals 12,235 days. That's the number of days between the birth of Yeshua and his resurrection on April 8th, 30 A.D. 
If we go back 33 and a half years, 12,235 days from the resurrection of Yeshua, starting the day count on the Sabbath of Nisan, 17, we land on Tishri 6 in the year 5 BC. On the Roman calendar, this is October 8th, 5 BC. Yeshua was born right in the middle of the period of time between the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement. Isn't that interesting? But what is more interesting is that it is exactly the same month and year that Adam was created on the sixth day of the creation week. Pattern is prophecy. So answer number three, how do I know Yeshua was born in the fall of 5 BC? The Bible tells me so. Question four, how do I know the year of creation on the Roman calendar is 4005 BC? Well, the Tishri 6 birth of Yeshua matches perfectly the Tishri 6 creation of the first Adam. Tishri 6 in 5 BC on the Roman calendar in October 8th was when Jesus was born. Discovering the creation date can be calculated now that we know when Yeshua was born in 5 BC and when we know the duration of time and days between Yeshua's birth and his resurrection. We can now calculate when the first Adam was created and that year also give us the creation date as Adam was created on the sixth day of the first creation week. If we start from a little 29, the day and month that ends the sabbatical year that the first Adam sinned in 3971, and go backwards in time, 12,235 days, we will discover the day and year that the first Adam was created. 3971 BC going back 12,235 days on the 360 day for a year calendar that God established in the beginning takes you to the 6th of Tishri in the creation week of 4005 BC. So the answer to number four is how do I know the creation date was Tishri 1, 4005 BC? The Bible tells me so. Question five, how do I know when the 7,000-year countdown for mankind ends. If we go back to the Bereshit Passover prophecy, we find the answer. The numeric time duration revelation is discovered in the first word in the Bible, the word beginning, that is the last five letters in the six-letter word Bereshit. Ta 400 times Yod 10 equals 4,000. From sin to the crucifixion of Yeshua that happened in 30 AD on the Roman calendar. The Yod 10 times Sheen, 300, plus 1 equals 3,001 years. Going forward 3,001 years from the cross event of 30 AD takes us to the very important future date on the Roman calendar of 3031 AD. The 7,000 year countdown on God's sabbatical calendar also takes us to the end of the millennial reign of Christ, who returns back to his home in heaven at the end of his 1,000 year reign that ends in 3031 AD. So answer 5. The 7,000 year countdown for mankind ends in 3031 AD. And this is also the time that concludes the 1,000 year reign of Yeshua on the earth. How do I know this? The Bible tells me so. If the 7,000 year countdown ends in the year 3031, then we now have a very important milestone by which we can authoritatively answer a couple more questions. So question number six, when is the second coming of Christ? The answer is 3031 AD, going back in time exactly 1,000 years, lands us on the year 2031 AD. This is the year of the second coming of Christ that begins the millennial reign of Yeshua. Answer 6. How do I know the second coming of Christ and the start date for the millennium is 2031 AD? The answer is the Bible tells me so. Question 7. Knowing that 2031 is the end of the 70th week of Daniel, we can go back in time exactly seven years and discover the very year that the 70th week of Daniel begins. So answer seven. The 70th week of Daniel begins in the year 2024 AD. 2024 AD is the year that the 70th week of Daniel begins ending seven years later on the Day of Atonement on a Jubilee year that ends with the second coming of Yeshua in 2031 AD to reign in Jerusalem with a rod of iron for exactly 1,000 years. And so the time of Jacob's trouble ends in 2031 AD. Question number eight. When does the 6,000 years God appointed for man to work come to an end? 
going backwards in time 3,000 years from the conclusion of the 7,000-year sabbatical calendar gives us the date for the beginning of the fifth day on God's 1,000-year-for-a-day calendar, confirming that it begins the year after the crucifixion of Yeshua in 30 A.D. It begins in 31 A.D. To be clear, the fifth day begins in 31 A.D. and ends in 1031 A.D., and the sixth day begins in 1031 A.D. and ends in 2031 A.D. on the Roman calendar. And finally, the seventh day begins in 2031, and on the Roman calendar it ends in 3031 A.D. So the answer to question 8, the sixth day that the Lord prophesied would be the six thousandth and final year for man to work, begins in 1031 A.D. and ends in 2031 A.D. on the Roman calendar. Question number nine. And when did the prophetic 7,000-year sabbatical calendar begin? So going back 7,000 years from 3031 A.D. lands us on the year 3970 B.C., the year after the sin of Adam, the first Adam that sinned in 3971 B.C. So check your own date duration calendar and you will discover that the number of years between 3970 B.C. and 3031 A.D. is exactly 7,000 years. I know it looks like it's 7,001, but it's not. This is correct. Remember, we have a problem every time we go between B.C. and A.D. as we have to make a correction. And keep in mind the second proof of this date based on the fact that pattern is prophecy. And so when you go forward 35 years from the creation date of 4005, we land on the end of the fifth and the beginning of the sixth sabbatical cycle, the sixth sabbatical year that begins in the year 3970 after completing five sabbatical years after creation date of 4005 B.C. So answer number nine, the 7,000 year sabbatical prophetic calendar began the countdown to eternity in the year 3970 B.C. It is interesting that the first sabbatical week of years was interrupted by the sin event that took place in 3971, exactly 34 years from creation to sin. And when does sinful man need a savior? The answer is after the sin of Adam in 3971 that corrupted all mankind and left us without hope until we were rescued by the grace of God based on the finished work of Yeshua as he paid the penalty for our sins on a wooden cross 1994 years ago in the year 30 A.D. Does 34 years complete the fifth sabbatical year from creation? The answer is no. But 35 does, as 35 is divisible by 7 with no remainder, further confirming the start date of the Lord's sabbatical 7,000-year calendar from mankind in 3970 B.C. And finally, question number 10. How do I know when Yeshua is coming back to take us home? The answer is, I don't. But I do know this. It's soon. Very soon.